Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality and other big picture stuff like we're liable to today with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. Wow, got a really great one for you today. Charlie Robinson is back. Charlie Robinson, super book a few years ago, Octopus of Global Control, been knocking it out of the park on his uh, podcast, Macroaggressions. Also, you'll always see him on the Fantastic Union of the Unwanted. He is like the hardest working man in all media. I was listening to your year in review and it's like a hundred shows last year. I know. I know. Uh, it's great. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank, yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm working hard at this because it matters to me and I want it to, I want this information to get out there and I want to have the conversations with people about this and I, and um, I, I feel driven to explain what I see. Not that I don't, not that I have it all figured out. I'm just bringing some pieces to this puzzle, but it seems very important given where we are right now as a society that we ring the alarm bells, you know, to the extent that we can and wake people up because uh, I'm not interested in sleepwalking through this. What, 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 what we, what these maniacs have planned for us requires us to be awake and aware of of the circumstances so that we can get out of the way if we need to so i i i i'm down with that i'm down with all that half the time and half the time i'm like are we maybe taking that in the wrong direction but let, let me ask you this kind of on a personal level uh, how do you do in just kind of normal company I mean, even because I ran into this the other day in a very kind of family kind of situation where somebody told me that I'm not fit for ordinary company and, and not in like not in red pill mode, even like I don't have to be in red pill mode to be in red pill mode, if you know what I mean, because once you're there for a while. Right. Well, tell me tell me how that works in your life. It, it It's tough. It's it's a dance. And I'll tell you, it came out of this. Actually, the whole like course, course correction can't happen uh, 15 plus years ago when I made the mistake of bringing up 9-11 at Thanksgiving dinner at my in-laws house at the time I was married before and it didn't go well. And I realized, and it didn't go well, and it was my fault, in, in fact, because I didn't have my argument down, the timing was wrong, the audience was wrong, everything about it was wrong. And it was 100% my doing. Now, it, I, I feel... I feel justified in discussing 9-11, but you have to know your audience and you have to, you know, realize, actually, this is where the, the first book, The Octopus, came out of, because what had happened was that <clears throat> I had no particular expertise on this topic of 9-11. I wasn't a pilot, a structural engineer, didn't work for the government, didn't work for the FAA. I didn't have, you know, I don't have any of those things. And so when I was trying to explain the reality of the situation of 9-11 to these people that were, were aghast at what I was talking about, they didn't view me as an expert. And, and that's fine because I wasn't an expert and, and I didn't know enough to have that conversation. But what had occurred to me was that if it wasn't coming from me, but if it was coming from somebody else, if, if it wasn't me saying these things, but if, if, in, if George W. Bush was saying this, or if I could show you examples of the, of, uh, the Rockefellers talking about this, or the Clintons, or the, these recognizable faces or names that people, people know and have some sort of, per, you know, have, have given them some sort of perceived credibility. If it wasn't me, it was them saying it, would it change would it change your mind? You know, and I think the answer to that was, well, sure, it would be a whole lot different if it wasn't you saying this, if it was somebody else. And so what I did with the first book, The Octopus, was I set out to find those voices, to find, um, I used 700 quotes from 500 different people that could sort of punctuate the points I was making. So if, so as an example of 9-11, if I'm writing about 9-11, and I'm not a pilot, but Captain Russ Wittenberg is a pilot, and he has said that he's flown these actual aircrafts of 9-11, and he knows he's saying with 100% certainty he, as a pilot, could not have made these um, 
banking turns that the hijackers allegedly made, that carries more weight than me saying it can't be done. And so part of what I realized in my interactions with normies is that I have to be very careful in how, in recognizing how they perceive me, because if they don't perceive me as having any level of ex expertise or, or knowledge on this, it's easy to dismiss me. So um, I try when I'm interacting with people now, I try to stay away from it as much as I can. You know, I try to stay away from these, the hardcore topics, unless someone gives me in, you know, unless somebody invites me in, or if somebody says, well, you've written books about this. I'm curious about, you know, if that, then that's a different story. But if it's, if we're watching TV and a commercial comes on and, you know, they're saying, you know, you got to donate to this 9-11 fund, you know, because we've got to get back at these Muslims that did this to us. I'm just going, oh, I'm just biting my lip. You know, I'm just going, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to ruin Christmas, Alex. I'm not going to ruin it this time. <laughs> So, so you're saying that basically, if you want to, you can fly under the radar. Because, because the reason I ask that is, you know, the problem with someone like you now, is that you have amassed so much information that it has changed you fundamentally, not only how you look on these red pill issues, but on how you look on everything, you know, this is a why people believe weird things kind of thing, which is the whole world. And once you cross that Rubicon, the whole world is a why you believe weird things, you know, why I believe my weird things, why you believe your weird things. But how do you not be outed as the arrogant, condescending bastard that you are? Because you do know a lot. You know, when some people say know it all, you're a know it all because you know a lot. Well, I'll tell you why I know what, why I know what I know and why I have the retention that I have. And it has to, it's not like a magic power or anything like that. It's from writing books. It's from being around this information and just being over it for weeks and months and re rewriting this sentence and backing up. And so I've got dates and names and they stick in my head. It's the same conversation I had with Whitney Webb about this too. Why she goes on Glenn Beck and he asks her a million questions and she's got dates and times. I know why that is. I mean, she's super smart. But I know why that is. It's because when you're writing and rewriting and changing this and moving this paragraph around, you're just looking at it over and over and over again. And so I have this information and it is, but it's, it's poison to people if they're not looking for it. If it, it is like a, I, and I have tried it every way you can try it, Alex. I've, I've tried the fire hose approach. I sit down here and let me tell you how things really are, blah, blah, blah. And people just, throw their hands up. They're, they're, they're either physically checked out. They're mentally checked out. They're not listening. And so through trial and error and a lot of embarrassment and, and ostracism from, from friends of mine, I have learned that if I want to have this conversation, and a lot of times I do want to have this conversation with people that are either close to me or people that are, are some people that I've just met, but, but are interested and in, they, they seem to have, be asking you know, seem to be talking about things that I might want to talk about. Uh, I've, I've found that the best way to really get that conversation going or to at least know how to navigate it is for me to ask questions of them, to get them going, to say, hey, what do you think about this? You know, what do you, or, or to get them to verbalize it and ask them a question, get them to verbalize it. And, 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 and what I found is, you know, if I'll say, hey man, how do you, like, what do you think accounts for two airplanes knocking down three buildings in lower Manhattan on 9-11? And, and their response will be, well, you know, I'm, um, wait, what? There were three buildings that got knocked down? Or, or it'll be, well, I, I, I don't know. I never really thought about that. So for so many of the interactions I have with people, what I discover almost immediately into the conversation is that they've never talked about it. They've never been asked about it. They've never really thought about it. It's been, you know, they see the news, they see the planes going, you know, I've used 9-11 as an example because everybody knows about it, but nobody, you know, very few people know the, the mechanics behind it. They just know what the, the media has told them. So it's a really good litmus test for me to figure out where I am with somebody in terms of their worldview is if you, if you think 9-11 was 19 Arab hijackers with box cutters, then, then I know 
that you're probably on board with a lot of the other established narratives. And, and that's a really tough nut to crack because you're going up against decades of psychological uh, uh, indoctrination, you know, through televisions and schools and all this stuff, probably of parents and friends reinforcing that. It just, it's, it's difficult to break through. It's difficult for me to, to meet with somebody who, who believes all the things and not, you know, and I can't, I don't really want to go to work on the, those people. I've come to prioritize my energy. And, and a lot of times with people like that, I don't see an opening. And, and so I'm not going to push too much, but, but, but God forbid somebody at a cocktail party, ask me what I do and want to talk about it. It's on. It's so on. And what I find is that a lot of people go, tell me more, you know, they look over both shoulders and they go, tell me more about this. You know, like they want to know, but they don't want people to know that they want to know. So there's a bit of shame in, in this for, for normies that like, you know, that they're in entertaining the concept that maybe there, there's an alternative explanation for some of the things that they've grown up believing. But, you know, and I think there's a lot of ego associated with that, all of us clearly have ego you you deal with the psychology of human beings and 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 ego is a, is a huge part nobody wants to be wrong so you have um it's a fascinating it's having the conversation is a fascinating case study in just human psychology really to to to, to find out why people believe what they believe and why they're they're so resistant to anything that challenges that, you know, because, oh, if that's true, well, then everything I believed before this conversation is garbage. So I have to rethink my whole worldview and I just have, I have to go to work tomorrow. I'm not ready for this, Alex. And I just want to, and I get it. I get it. I get it why people go, I'm not ready for this. Uh, you don't get it. You don't get it. And I don't get it. I don't I respect mean, because, it. I understand well, it, but I don't uh, respect it. When somebody says that, they don't get it because you're a super smart guy. Like you said, when you talk to Whitney Webb, the reason you relate is because you're a super smart guy. I heard uh, Thank you. I heard a doctor race recently, he's kind of, I'm gonna get him on the show and he's been totally ostracized and all that from a long time ago, Richard Fleming and he's- really Oh yeah, good. yeah, yeah. Have you, have you had him on? We, we had him on the Union of the Unwanted, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so uh, at one point Fleming goes, you know, he starts getting, he's talking in his monotone. This is for the normie, woken, half woken, red pill, half red pill people, half a dose. And then he goes, now, he goes, when I talk to people who really know their stuff, and then we sort of, he goes, my whole pace changes, my whole, I get more animated in this and that, because I know this science and I'm dying to talk to somebody who really knows it too. And I kind of think you are on that level, right? So yeah. no, you are not, I get it, you know, I get that you've just marched down to the Catholic church for four generations. And even though you found out that that guy down there was screwing all these little kids and destroyed all these lives, you said, well, you know, what am I gonna do? It's still the closest church to my house. I still have to go. You right. do not get that. I don't get that. I mean, there's a line that we would all draw in the, in the sand and you draw in the sand. The other thing about you that's different is you come from a from a world that a lot of us can relate to in terms of you were success oriented, you were trying to make things happen, you were doing things to manifest. You know, you weren't sitting around putting a pendant around your neck and saying, you know, oh, you know, you were you were trying to manifest things in a more conventional way, and you are, and you did, and you still are manifesting things. But that's different than our, a lot of the folks in our community too. And I don't wanna say our community because I don't have a community. And one of the things I guess I'm gonna stumble in here, stumble into here in this talk, and we talked about this last, the last time you were on and it kind of always is an issue for me is, you know, the alt media needs to clean up its act too in terms of we are so co-optable when we adopt these stupid ideas and let them, you know, perpetuate. Like even one of my one of my pet peeves, and I just talked to Sam uh, uh, Tripoli just the other day on Zero. We had a great conversation. I love Sam. Sam Me is just too. awesome. Awesome yeah. guy. Uh, it, flat Earth. Flat Earth. I, I mean, I don't care about your flat Earth. You know what I care about is you just moved everyone two steps closer to 
accepting COVID. Two steps closer mm-hmm. to accepting COVID and one step closer to the climate scam. Because mm-hmm. what you've said is there is no really way to know or understand things. Science isn't meaningful other than just what I observe and, you know, convince me and it's all, you know, we, that is rampant in this thing that we're calling alt media as well. And it makes us so, so co-optable. Yeah. 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 It's, it, it's such a, it's such a, a, a funny batch of people here in the alt, alternative media a lot of people you know there's a look there a lot of people are searching for answers they're trying to figure out who's got the best information and um and i don't think it's all collected in one person's brain we all bring different things to the table i'm open to having you know there might be concepts or things that i'm fascinated to talk about but I would never write about them because I don't know enough about it. Like if somebody says that there's an opening to the inner earth in Antarctica and that there's, you know, secrets around that and everything, does it sound crazy? Oh, a hundred percent crazy. Am I interested in hearing more about it? Sure. From a science fiction standpoint, I would love to hear more about it. Does the Richard, you know, Admiral Richard Byrd is in, in his diaries and things like that. Does that make me sound, does it make me go, hmm, yeah, it does. But again, I have to drop that. I have to leave that sort of in my, like, this is stuff that I'm interested in. Like, um, I don't know, emotional junk food or something, you know, like j- just stuff that I, I, I kind of like from time to time. But I don't, I can't write about that because I don't know it and I don't understand it and I don't know how it all works. So I like, you know, I I try to keep my stuff as, as provable as I can to the extent that I can prove it, you know, because let's be honest, some of the stuff, you know, you, you, you do the best you can, um, but you, you don't know, you know, you're talking about classified documents from 70 years ago and things like that. I don't know, but I, I like to try and stay in the realm of of logic and reason and, and reality, but I also have to give myself the flexibility to um, be wrong, too, and and the flexibility to recognize that that's okay to be wrong on from time to time, as long as your in the your as long as your intentions are solid. And and I and I and I've kind of put this in the the first book, and I I, th- I think I've said it. Well, I know I've said it multiple times, but my 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 standard is that I I reserve the right to change my mind if I'm presented with new evidence that is better than the old evidence I had. And I like and I don't do that to be wishy washy. I do that because I recognize my ability to be wrong about things. We all do. And, 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 and part of when, when we're talking about the alternative media, having some bad habits is, is our, our inability to be flexible on some things and to say, no, this is what I believe. And this is the way it is. And it's like, well, what if you were wrong about, what if you were right about 95% of the other things, but you were wrong about this 5%, do you want to be right? Or do you want to eventually get it right? And my, my feeling is I just want, I want to get it right. Even if I'm wrong about it initially, I want to get it right. And so I try to do that to the extent that I can. And I, and I know that when you're dealing with, you know, we're not dealing with two plus two equals four. That's pretty easy. What we're talking about is we're going up against the most experienced uh, disinformation apparatus in the world in the CIA and the Mossad and all these intelligence agencies. It's a, it's a wonder we get anything right. We have the mainstream twas, media. Twas always, twas always thus. I mean, <laughs> so, so go back in history and, and it's always been like that. I mean, my methodology, which I just kind of honed in on lately is one, follow the data wherever it leads. You gotta go wherever it leads. And number two, follow the deception wherever it leads. I mean, if you're getting jacked up by uh, Andrew Kaufman, who's going to be down there in Acapulco, spinning yep. his no virus, uh, which is uh, t- to me, I, I, to me, that's been revealed as an op. Anyone who doesn't see the whole, you know, 
there is no virus. There's no such thing as viruses. There's no such thing as rabies. Uh, David Icke, who banned, is so interesting. David Icke, how do you, you know, you can't move around. Gotta, that's a whole other thing. But I mean, you're going to be there rubbing shoulders with, uh, with Andrew Kaufman. And I don't know if he's, you know, just following the cheese in his crazy kind of world, whatever, but he's creating a co-optable situation. Think of what he does in terms of the COVID thing, in terms of the divide and rule. Now he has this little kind of fringe, crazy circle of people who think there are no viruses. I did s several shows on this. There's no rabies. There's no yeah. ra the rabies doesn't exist. Oh, it's probably just worms in your dog. It's right. So if we don't, if we don't follow the deception wherever it leads, even if it leads into our own conference that we're going to, especially then... if it leads to our own conference yeah. that we're going to. Yeah. I like uh, Daniel List over at Dark Journalist. He talks about this, this concept of there's, there's the conspiracy, then there's the junk conspiracy, and then there's the truth. And that, that they send out two versions to split people and then uh, all is the truth. And so, you know, the conspiracy is sort of like, oh, there's a conspiracy here. This is real. Let's sort of figure this out. And then there's the junk one, which is just sort of like airplane chaff, you know, that's just set, set out to to distract the missiles and send them a different, uh, a different direction so that, um, you know, so that, you know, they split the group. It's, it's, that's what I'm saying. You, you, you go up, you're going up against the best disinformation agents in the world cycle up people that understand the, how the human brain uh, brain works you're in a you're in a great spot because you understand that better than most people i am at a severe disadvantage and and only learning and catching up to the extent that i can about how the human brain works and you know and we see these psychological experiments the milgram test and you know all these things and you go oh my God, you know, like we're real, we think we're so tough and we think we're so solid and we think we're so married to our ideas. And then a guy in a lab coat with a clipboard comes around. And next thing you know, you're cranking up the, the electrical uh, currencies to your neighbor in the next room and cooking the guy, you know, because some guy with a lab coat told you to keep doing it or you're going to mess up the experiment. So I have come to learn how little I know through this whole thing. And I think that's kind of liberating. I, 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 you know, from the beginning have, have wanted to make sure that I, I don't mislead anybody into thinking that I know more than I know. I, I, I tell people what I know. I tell people when I'm speculating and, and, and I, and then I talk about educated guesses too. And so I, I reserve, you know, I reserve that right to be wrong. And in fact, if someone can prove to me that things are wrong, that's one step closer to me getting it right. So I sort of welcome that in a sense. I don't want to be wrong. I want, I mean, well, I, let me take that back. There's a lot of things I do really want to be wrong about, you know, because to admit that this is true means to admit that this world is really broken in some ways. And, and so I don't like that. But at the same time, I don't think it's very noble to pretend like you'd like that stuff doesn't exist. I think I think that we we do ourselves a disservice if we if we sort of turn a blind eye to to things. Like you mentioned, the, like the, the church down the street is doing unspeakable things to kids. Yeah, but it's the closest church to me. Okay, great. But are you willing to turn a blind eye to what's happening in there? Because I I'm not. That's a line I have to draw. Is that when I see things like that, I I. I try to speak out about them, not at Thanksgiving dinner anymore. So, so I'm not that. really, I'm not really a, a psychology guy. If anything, I'm just kind of an anti-psychology guy. I just kind of stumble over psychology mm -hmm. to get to where I really want to be, which is who am I? Why am I here? And the conclusion that we are not biological robots in a meaningless universe, which leads to the question, will we all burn in hell for all our all our sins and that from someone who's not a Christian. I'm not a Christian. Used to be a Christian. You go understand the science of spirituality and what we know and you just can't maintain uh, being a Christian. And if you think you can, then you're really not looking at the data. So I'm always about who am I? Why am I here? And then that has led me to kind of stumble into 
psychology and why is psychology saying that there isn't a voice inside your head why, that, that, that you're meaningless but if i was to take like the stuff that you're really good at the political stuff which you just nail and again you know if people have forgotten the octopus of global control and i'm glad you kind of just touched on it briefly because then uh the second book too was the, the controlled second. controlled demolition of the american empire that one I wrote with with Berwick. And we, the third one, the third one that the, the, when we talked, you were working on third this one. one Hypocrisy, surviving in a world of cultural double standards, where I put Uncle Sam in a straight jacket and a padded cell with Thorazine eyes and all of that. So that is your that is your bailiwick. So here's kind of where another topic i'm going to pivot on and want to talk about that's more kind of in line with what you do because uh, uh, just yesterday i was i was talking to johnny vedmore and he's been on your show you know and yeah love it uh, and him and uh whitney uh on you know unlimited hangout phenomenal i mean yeah. just phenomenal work investigative journalism of first order that it w what it does for any of us who are been around a little while you go w where did this go <laughs> where where did this stuff that used to really happen and be kind of the backbone of what we thought journalism was about you know at its core that has just kind of disappeared but it has so anyways you know i'm i'm looking at his work and i'm going you know johnny i'm interpreting this differently than you are and i want to bounce some of these things off of you because i look at the the great reset thing mm -hmm. and the Klaus Schwab thing, which I'm still amazed that, you know, I talk about normies. I can talk to people and go, well, you know, the great reset thing. And there's a stare, you know, they don't know. Yeah. I said, you know, you will own nothing and you will be happy. And they'll go like, no. And I'm like, no, you, you got it. You have to know this stuff. But anyways, there is that, that still that level of kind of unknowing. So here, here's, Here's ray of, ray of hope, silver lining playbook kind of stuff that I'm going to bounce okay. off you. Let's start with, you will own nothing and you will be happy. That to me is a ray of hope because clearly that is the absolute worst marketing slogan you could possibly come up with. You have to be so dumb. And it speaks to this idea that we think these guys are so brilliant and they have it all worked out and it's all going to just play out their way. No, it did not when you come up with something that dumb. And then you try and scrub it like today, like nowadays, you know, this is like, I don't know, some stupid celebrity who says, no, I didn't say it. It's like, Dude, it's in your Twitter. We all got it with right. Wayback Machine. We're looking at it right here. Well, I tell you, this is the level of, you know, you will own nothing and you will be happy. That is silver lining. As a marketing major from the University of Southern California, um, I appreciate a good marketing campaign. The World Economic Forum's marketing campaign is garbage. It is an advertisement for global communism the way you would sell a unbuilt high-rise building to a group of potential investors, right? You just, you go, it's a glossy marketing. You go, look, look, look at all of this. You, you, we're going to have um, smart cities. Nobody wants to be in a dumb city, Alex. You're going to have a smart city, right? And, and, and you'll own nothing and 15-minute communities, you know, because of climate change and everything. And universal basic income will give you all this stuff. And I go I go through their whole sales pitch and it's going to be unicorns and rainbows and beautiful buildings and all this. And I and I think to myself, I bet this is similar to the pitch for communism back in with, for the Soviet Union. And instead of what you get, you know, we're all going to be work, you know, comrade, there'll be plenty of food for everybody, you know. And then w the reality of the situation, it's like when you buy something online, right? You go, this doesn't look anything like what I bought online. You know, you, the, what you get are drab Soviet era buildings that all look exactly the same, that are gray and this in boring and suck the soul out of you. And you get dumb ideas. The, the world economic forums ideas, their, their concept for this is dumb. It's not, it's not, I am, I'm, I'm with you on this. It is. But doesn't not, that lift your spirits, Charlie? He explained this to me and, and, and I forget who it was, but they made, it was a great point. It was, um, 
it might have been David Icke. It it but it was it, they were talking about having a having a plan, talking about these guys having like a, a ten step plan. Now and and he said, you know, the thing is that like you're here you're here saying, well, they've got a ten step plan, and and if they accomplish all this, it's over for us. But he's like, you got to remember that if they if you trip them up on step two. They can't get to step three, four, five, six, and seven. He said, and they're having a hard time with step one, which is getting everybody out of the gate to inject themselves with a experimental poison. You know, it's not going well when you have to incentivize people with laps around Talladega Speedway and lottery tickets and free donuts. That's a that's a admission that this is clearly. I mean, you would hope, you would hope it's clearly not plan A. It has to be plan B or maybe even plan C. So with that in mind, knowing that you've kind of gummed up the operations early on in the first couple of steps of this process, it's, that's tremendously inspirational to, to someone like me who says, all right, well, if, if step 10 is locking the door on this digital prison, they're never going to get there if they can't even get you to inject yourself and they, they're they having to, um, you know, uh, incentivize celebrities and rappers and uh, doctors and all these people that they have to pay pay to um, to, you know, shill for their their concept, their their idea, their vaccine uh, component. This is not going smoothly. And by the way, they're on a timeline. It's 2030 is their 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 benchmark agenda. 2030. Oh, bullshit! They 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 can throw they can throw out any other timeline. The other way it's not they going well is is Charlie Robinson's blowing up, and he's not the only one. And you you can ignore that for a, a little while, but you can't really ignore that. You know, you 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 look at uh, Facebook. Mm -hmm. Their model is failing, right? Their model is failing and they will not be rescued, which is the other thing that our community somehow gets wrong that, oh, the Sandy Hill, you know, they're all gonna, no, it's still a dog eat dog competitive thing. And when somebody kicks your ass, then they're the next guy up and they're gonna be promoted and you got bad ideas, they fail in the marketplace, they don't do. Microsoft would be out of business if that guy didn't do Xbox. The Go fun pattern though when you look at facebook and you and and you look at microsoft transformational technology company started in a dorm room by a nerdy uh, harvard freshman who partners up with a bunch of people with some stolen technology or at least that's the the, the rumors the stolen technology the ibm stolen technology um, no, I mean he just bought it. I mean he didn't um, have to steal it. I mean it's then, stealing it. It's stealing it in the same way that you got five other dorks in your dorm room that have written the code and don't know what to do with it. And you say, "Hey, can I can I use that?" And I, the, the only way I, I got a you know my undergraduate was information systems, then I got an MBA, and then I went back to get a PhD in artificial intelligence. And halfway through, I go, "Screw this! I need to start a company into artificial intelligence." But you know, the only way I got through that was stealing other people's computer programs that have bugs in them and <laughs> fix the bugs because I couldn't write the program and I wasn't a good typist and I was dyslexic, you know, which is good when you leave a comma in the wrong place, but I could right. figure out the problem. So I could just take somebody else's program and go, oh, you got it 90% right. I'll just fix this and this and I can turn it in before you get yours in. Yeah. yeah. It's funny that the, the, you know, there, and also you look at these parallels between the Rockefellers and, and, and Gates and you go, well, they, they both had this like monopolistic hold over an industry until the government got involved and government got involved and broke them up into these pieces, which I think, you know, with the Rockefellers, I think a case could be made that they were, it was better for them that they got broken up into these pieces. And as a, and, and, and they, they, they start the antitrust uh, suits with Microsoft in the late nineties and they go through all that stuff. And what comes out of, as a result of both of these cases, the Rockefeller foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates foundation as these PR vehicles to clean up their image. And then, and, and also let's be Let's be real honest. They're tax shelters too. So you, exactly. you fi finance exactly. your, you yeah. put your money right. over there, and then use that as a as a vehicle to drive your agendas uh, under the guise of uh, saving the world. Right, <laughs> that's what they do. So right. and you're so, also allowed to invest that money, and you don't have to pay any taxes on it either. So if you think about that from a, you know, you and you can invest that money 
And sometimes you can find creative ways without even a lot of think of thinking about it to enrich your non-foundational kind of things, yeah. right? So yeah. now you invest in all these things to save the planet and genetically understand uh, greater and, uh, you know, all this. And by the way, who now is going to be the software provider for, you know, to, oh, Microsoft, you know, so that's, it, yeah. Very convenient the way that's set up. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of this happening and, um, and, and it, it, and it look, and it leads us into this world economic forum group who they've taken, they've taken, um, the concepts, which I think are probably anchored in decency. Like we're going to fix these problems with the world. We're going to transform this world. We're going to, uh, we're going to raise up the living standards of these people. It's all, it's all horseshit, of course, but, but the, but the idea that, that you, you would collectively take your, the benefits that you have of being a very wealthy person from making all of this money from starting a transformational technology company. And you're going to partner up with other people that have also had great success. And you guys are going to use your, the, the methodology that you use to make your companies great. You're going to use that to fix the world in theory. Sounds great, right? A, a case can be made that, 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 that if you have like an altruistic, if these are actually good guys, that the idea is look, I mean, who do you want to, help make this world better some guy that can't keep a job at, at long john silvers for more than a couple of weeks or do you want a guy that that knows how to build businesses you know because we and you go well yeah i definitely would want the guy that knows how it all works the problem is these people are so they're not they don't want what we want and they 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 have a, a skewed worldview and, I, and I, I, i'm going to challenge that this is the conversation we had uh, uh last time which was so excellent and you have the ability to be so nuanced in the way you talk about this stuff which is so refreshing because a lot of times we don't hear that but you know last time we talked about the confessions of an economic hitman you mm -hmm. know which was pivotal for you and and and, mm -hmm. and understanding and having this different understanding and and what we talked about is you know which i threw on the table last time was like yeah, it's horrible, you know, it to enslave these people in a different way. Yeah. But you go down to Uganda and you build that uh, billion dollar dam for electricity in the middle of the jungle that nobody needs, you know. You do keep the commies out and maybe that's not such a bad thing. And if you look at the World Economic Forum and not look at it through the lens of what you just said, but look at it as like, and this is what I told uh, Johnny, Johnny Vedmore, I said, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the silver lining thing in this is that I was all worried that this was a, a new world order or globalist kind of thing. And I'm, I'm comforted somehow that this is a Henry Kissinger CIA thing. I get it. It's <laughs> just make America great again. Oh, okay. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm more on board now that that's what it is. Yeah. There's a, there's a financial component in this for them. And that actually is, is it, like you said, it makes it the, the, the new world order part where they aren't, where they've got all the money in the world and they're not necessarily in Those are, those people scare the shit out of them. Exactly. The, the world economic forum people, which is the, which they're saying, wouldn't it be great if we can convince everybody that they can only shop at the company store and we'll build the company store so we can make all this money. That is different. That's a take it one step further and see what you think of this, Charlie. So what what, what reveals itself to me is that one uh, Klaus is is a protege of Henry Kissinger. Yes. And in following those footsteps, again, it's kind of more like a make America great kind of thing. It's like world domination thing. And if you look at the World Economic Forum and you look at Russia, and again, the guys at Unlimited Hangout did a great job of this because Russia took, you know, a Putin world youth leader or whatever that thing is. I forget. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was, he was, and he was at that, he was on the ins and now he's on the outs, right? They've tried to, yeah. <laughs> tried to scrub him, which is so stupid. Tried to yeah. scrub that he was a part of that. But if you look, what they what russia wants to do with it they want to go full commie with it they hear the the whole thing and they're like this is great are you kidding me we have we have more surveillance cameras than anyone we can put this in place oh this idea of this uh a passport this vaccine pass super we could do that tomorrow and this idea of you know locking everybody up 
got it, you know? And then all of a sudden they go do Ukraine and we go, whoa, 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 pull back on that now, bro. Because what I suspect, and this is what I guess I'd like to hear you, uh, your thought on it is, what's really at play here is that we are gonna continue to control the, uh, the, the US crypto. We want that crypto to be our crypto, the U.S. crypto. Mm. And Russia, you want to talk about linking up with, you talking to China over there? No, 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 no. Talking about going down to Brazil and, you know, and you're going to do that. No, 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 no. There's only one crypto, guys. It's USA, USA. And that's how we want it. And so, you know, China, we took the chips away from them. You see where we're not... <laughs> Who knows? I, I don't I want to like to use the word Biden because I don't know what that really means, that yeah. puppet that's there. But did you see him where he pulled the chips, the AI chips, and he pulled all the people out and stuff like that? Yeah. Those two things in concert of, you know, slapping down Putin from the World Economic Forum, scrubbing him from that. And then China is to say, that's what it says to me, is that, you know, We'll, we'll play all this shell game with all this stuff that you think we're doing. But what we're really about is the U.S. fiat crypto has to we have to own that. It The octopus book comes out, right? There's eight tentacles in it. And everyone I just go out and I start doing press for it. And people say, so what's the most dangerous tentacle? And I think everybody assumes I'm going to say the military. And what I say is the banking. The banking tentacle is the most most da dangerous component. And here we go. We, we go from 100 years of the Federal Reserve printing press, these fiat dollars. We go, we, we, we have Bretton Woods. We, we wind up going off the gold standard at some point and watching the value of this currency just start to collapse. We did a very good job of controlling the world through our dollar system. And those days are coming to an end. And th that's what Berwick- Let's hope not. Well, that's what Berwick and I talked about, the, the end of the petrodollar situation. I think that, I think that this has um, ramifications. And, and you see this when we're talking about Russia and we're talking about China. We're talking about these two ha being forced due to these worldwide sanctions, being forced Russia to look for partners for a variety of things, their oil, and also their sw the SWIFT banking system that they were kicked off of. And in China, this happened to China. China built their own version of that. Russia thought about doing that in 2014, and I think they did, to a certain extent, build a, a, a version. But when they were thrown off of that, that SWIFT platform, they, they said to the Chinese, can we work with you on, on clearing these international wire funds? And they said, sure, no problem. We'll, we'll do it with us. We're, we, I say we, because it's, it's not we, but it's the, the West, I think, is making a, a, a miscalculation with the Russia thing because they're, they're forcing Russia into tighter relationships with China. And China has a very, I'd say, prominent uh, relationship with Saudi Arabia. And, and, this, and this all matters for the dollar in the, in, in the end because I can envision a scenario in which Xi's representatives, or maybe even him himself, are in Saudi Arabia talking to that, uh, to MBS and his group and saying, listen, you got this petrodollar situation, but that's the 70s. That's when America is buying two and a half million barrels of oil a day from, from you guys. Reasonable to have that. They only buy about 400,000 barrels a day. You know who buys two and a half million barrels a day from you guys? We, the Chinese, we do. Why don't we do something... Why don't we do this? Why don't we modernize this arrangement? Why don't we get away from the petrodollar and move to the petro you want? Now, it sounds crazy, of course, and it sounds like something that would never happen, and it would never happen if you had the Bush family and that whole regime with their tight relationship with the Saudis still in control. But you've got Joe Biden, and like you said, whoever, whatever that means, Joe Biden, whoever's wearing the Joe Biden mask, um, and they don't have a very good relationship with Saudi Arabia. They get they are they are not strong. They are sort of embarrassed. I can foresee, a, a, I could, and I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I'm saying I could I could foresee that conversation happening where Saudi Arabia starts to think, well, really our our best partner here are the Chinese. They we can work with them. And America's sort of going the wrong direction here. I would say, though, it, 
as I have that thought about the whole scenario, there is one thing that makes me think that it wouldn't happen. And that is that the Saudis are crystal clear on how America would, would react to something like that. I think that they, they would be terrified of what America would do in retaliation for something like that. But, but have you ever been, have you ever been to Russia? Uh, no, it's a shit show. Yeah. <laughs> I've been there four times. It's yeah. a shit show. Um, it, it, China, I, I have not been to uh, China. I've been to Taiwan. Been to um, Shanghai. It's weird. They ain't gonna win. It just doesn't. It doesn't work. It, it it runs itself out, you know. In the same way, like like we talk about North Korea and stuff like that, and we talk about the world's greatest golfer, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the, the great leader Kim with his five hole in ones in his it's, that it However amazing. long, however long that goes, as crazy as our system is, our system seems to come out on top because it promotes this kind of freewheeling capitalism. Russia is not going to win, and Putin is is a he's a totalitarian dictator, right? And I I can't believe that people paper over that like Oliver Stone. I just heard him the other day. It's like, dude, are you like what is? You're such a brilliant guy. You can't see through uh, the Putin thing. <laughs> We're just having fun here. Is di, di, are you aware of this? Are you aware of the the Biden chips thing? Let me read this into the show. In short, the Biden administration wants to prevent, take that out, they already did, prevent by executive order and by physically pulling workers, U.S. workers in China and tell them, you better go home if you're working for any chip people in China. Mm -hmm. Wants to prevent China from buying the world's best chips and machines to make them. These chips will power not only the next generation of military, but also AI technologies, which is what this is really about, mm -hmm. but also make self-driving vehicles, blah, blah, blah. They actually did this. Oil is great, but think chips. And then, you know, who's manufacturing 70% of the world's chips, uh, the, these very, very high-end chips, which are all that matters. I mean, if you're manufacturing the chips that go into toys, you know, have at it. We'll let China do that all day long. Vacuum right. cleaners and, you know, all that stuff. You keep doing that all day long. But the AI that's really already, you know, CPT chat and is running, mm -hmm. we can see it in our face, is running the world, uh, that you're not going to have. And even if you think Taiwan, you're kind of missing the point because IBM is the one who's actually designing the chips. So uh, again, I think looking at the chessboard one step back, I'm encouraged. I get this. This is, uh, this is uh, make America great again. We're going to kick your ass empire, which is horrible in all the confessions of an economic uh, hitman kind of way, but it's the world we live in. And we better hope that we do stay on top because the other people who would take over and who we would see on top, we don't want to be on top uh, even worse. No, it's it. It, it, it I, I would have a hard time living under a Chinese dict dictatorial power structure. Uh, I mean, I think that's putting it, it, it mildly. I, I, it, this is the devil I know, <laughs> the white devil I know uh, here in America, as opposed to the other, the devil that you don't know, which I don't see, look, I don't see, I don't see the Klaus Schwab group getting the traction that they want, but I do have very big fears about the Rockefeller United Nations groups and what they want. And that relationship with China has been something that they've been growing for a very long time for, well, at least I guess since the, the, the seventies with Nixon and, and, um, and David Rockefeller and Kissinger going up over there and opening up that sort of door to us. I, I've, I've read too much and heard too much about this pivot to China being sort of, you know, well, they're going to take the next, phase of this. And I'm obviously concerned. I don't like the idea of any empire, but like you said, if you've got to pick one, well, if I'm in America, uh, if the American empire, at least theoretically would kill me last, I suppose. I don't know. Maybe that's not, well, the, maybe the that's other, an incorrect calculation. Whatever, uh, progress we could make in terms of reversing the forces of that empire much better chance of doing it with our empire. 
than for sure. uh, somebody else's. For sure, for sure. And China is is taking this, you know, the like the the social credit component of this, which I'd say is a, is is a factor in this World Economic Forum. It's really being test driven in China. And I remember reading years ago about Shenzhen, the city of Shenzhen, uh, having. I think they said, you know, you know, millions and millions, not just cameras, but facial recognition cameras. And they talked about this um, this example of a guy getting on a get, waiting to get on a bus, and, and and he lights up. He gets on the bus, comes, he gets on the sit on the bus, he lights up a cigarette. Facial recognition cameras in the bus catch him, see who he is, figure it out. It's illegal to smoke on the bus. The fine is let's just say ten dollars or whatever. By the time that guy gets off the bus, gets around the corner and is walking to his job, his cell phone pings and says, you um, were caught smoking on a bus, which is illegal. You were fined $10. It was deducted already from your Weibo account, which is like a Chinese PayPal. And you have been um, marked down for that. Re-education program. Yeah, that was years ago, right? So, so this idea that you know, well, sometime in the future they're going to do the future's now, depending on where you are on this planet, and and that scares me because that wh wh where I I take a look at that and I go, oh, like I see the dystopian breadcrumbs leading to to where it's going, and but yet this another person who doesn't know what we are talking about, doesn't understand, hasn't thought about this, you know, a couple steps ahead as to where this empire is going. They see that and they go, oh, that'll be great because then nobody will be smoking on the bus anymore. Yes, hell yes, I hate that. I hate and that secondhand go, smoke. We don't even allow it. In Southern California, we don't even allow it on the beach. Which I think I know. It's pretty over the top. Hey, man, you're <laughs> out on the beach. You want to let them know. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, here, here, here's the... Two, two, two more silver lining playbooks. One is Kissinger and one is uh, Frederick Douglass. And I guess I'll go uh, uh, Frederick Douglass. I bring him up all the time. People get out their nose all bent out of shape because we hate to really look back at slavery and everything that it was and how these Southern gentlemen went to church and then came back and went out and fucked their nine-year-old slave and just yeah. didn't see any problem with that and didn't see that as satanic again i'm not christian i don't know what satanic means but when you get that thought in your head that that's okay to enslave another person to take their infant out of their arms and go sell that uh, to you know torture and sadistic and all that it, and i guess that goes two ways for me one it goes we have to own our freaking history and Black Lives Matter may be a total scam, and it is, but it points to a reality that oh, yeah. we lived we lived through that, and then we fought a war over it, and then we let the Ku Klux Klan do it for another hundred years. And we did it again and again and again. And decision and law and World Economic Forum after World Economic Forum, which we had 50 of them back then, so we've lived through a lot of crazy satanic shit in this country and to pretend like we need to get, you know, all worked up about this latest one. And my mom grew up in Tennessee and she remembers when she was a kid that there were colored drinking fountains. So this isn't like a million years ago. This isn't like something where we're digging out in the desert and looking at sediment layers and going oh it looks like there was slavery 400,000 years ago like there's people that remember this and and th these concepts and it's disgusting for sure and so it but here we go you you can you can have a concept like this that needs to be examined the treatment of all sorts of people not just black people but the treatment of of all sorts of people and you can want to have that conversation, and then here comes the media, and they hijack it, and next thing you know, it's Black Lives Matter. It's not the problem. The problem is acknowledging that that is fucking satanic. 
whatever that means, that is satanic. And the same thing is happening now. And this is a spiritual battle. Again, I'm not a Christian, folks. Never but if mind. you're not thinking about it on that level, then it's Black Lives Matter and reparations and pro uh, political issues. It's like, no, it's like, how could that happen? How could someone's soul allow them to do that to another human being? And once we begin to understand that, we go, oh, that's what the Chinese want. They're tapping into that same energy. That's what Klaus Schwab wants. That's how we can get into this mode of thinking we want to satisfy that need to control, to dominate, to do. If, if we don't go there, then we're always going to be talking about the mansions that they bought from Black Lives Matter, and we can get riled up about that. We're never going to get to the core issues. Yeah, it's human beings are capable of some horrible stuff, but but a lot of times we get we have to get whipped up into it, or you have to learn, you know, learn, you know, the idea of of how you treat other people. I grew up in like a suburbs. Actually, I grew up in Palm Springs, huge gay community, right? So my worldview from growing up there was that that was all just kind of normal. It wasn't my thing, but it was relatively normal. But just a few thousand miles away where my mom grew up in Tennessee, it was very abnormal. That would not like the, the, the relationship that the, the people have with one another, same country, theoretically the same types of people, right? Uh, living through the same era, vastly different views on what is acceptable in society and what is not. And, and now we're in a place where the information war, the media is, 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 is putting thoughts in people's heads, kids, younger and younger, that the planet is overburdened and that the, the best thing to do is to kill themselves and not contribute to this carbon or definitely don't have kids and all these things. We are we are starting to normalize this in this suicidal, like a suicide cult. And and I'm and and it's it's terrifying because it's you can see the machine at work targeting younger and younger people giving them anxiety climate anxiety climate change we're all gonna die uh, would you ever think of that if it wasn't for the media pumping that in no of course not you'd never even it'd never cross your mind so we've got a we've got a battle that's raging on multiple fronts you mentioned the spiritual battle for sure a, a, a spiritual i'm sure you and sam talked about that on zero you know he he's it's a spiritual battle man a hundred percent. It's an information war. Who's got the best information? And if you don't have the best information, can you at least suppress the other guy's best information? You know, can, what can you do there? Culture war. Everybody's trans. Everybody's non-binary. The planet is going to end. They've gotten people so anxious and so screwed up that they don't even trust the planet that they're living on. They don't even know what's going on. So what a, what a, as a writer, you know, sitting in the bleachers, watching this whole thing, fascinating. As a human being that has to participate in it, pretty terrifying. And especially one that has a, has a kid, you know, who's going to have to navigate this world. And it's like, how do I teach my daughter how to navigate this world when I'm still trying to figure out what the best strategy is for navigating this? And, and, and you know, and I know some of the easy ones stay away from the media, but you might detach yourself from the media, but everybody that you're interacting with hasn't. So they're all getting their information from the media. So it's a really weird landscape right now to uh, to try and navigate. And the more you, um, you know, the more I look at this, I, I, I find bits and pieces where I, I feel optimistic and I say, okay, well, the plan isn't coming together as they would like it to. And then I look around and I go, yeah, but if the plan is also to scramble the brains of a lot of young kids and get them feeling like um, all hope is lost, well, then that plan is being kind of accomplished, it seems. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not, I mean, have you felt that? Do you feel that like they're, I, they're, I do. they're working I get on a you. young generation? I absolutely. And I listened to your show recently, your excellent, excellent show on Ask the Aspen Institute. Is that what oh, Aspen? Aspen? Yeah. 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 yeah uh, phenomenal. You know, and they're going for the kids, you know, they're directly yeah. targeting the kids. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, 
Uh, it, it's very, it's very depressing. And that's why I'm hitting you really hard with this silver lighting playbook kind of theme kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, and, to, and, to, cause to you could warm me up well, a little bit. To, well, not, not exactly. Shelley. One, you are awesome. Like there are very few people that can stay in this kind of dialogue with this without just kind of melting down or, you know, and, and you, you're totally engaged, which is, is great. And I don't know if I'm right, you know, obviously, you know, we're, I don't know if I'm right either. <laughs> we're all, we're all trying to figure it out. But I think if we, we, I think, you believe that I'm coming from the right place, even if we're if there's an issue that we disagree with, and I believe you are coming from the right place. That's a that's a that's a lot better than most people I'd say that that are in conversations with one another. Well, that's that's an awesome part. That the 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 real part for me is that I believe in your data because you support it. You know, you bring the data and then you back it up. And the other thing that I've said is like the deception. You're open to the deception. When people just bring the data and they can't interpret it because they don't understand this paradigm of deception that's going on, both intentional and self-deception too, and they're not able to sort through any of that, then it's kind of a a pretty flat conversation very quickly. Yeah. Well, you get complacent and you start thinking you're right and always, always right. I'm, I'm always maybe Par I don't know if paranoid is the right word. I'm I'm always expecting challenges, and and I like that to 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 my belief, and I like that because it keeps me sharp, and it keeps me saying, oh, shit, if I have to defend this, can I? If I'm going to say something crazy, and I don't mind saying something crazy, but if I say something crazy, am I just saying it to get a to try and make people say, oh, that guy says crazy things, or? Because I don't really want to do that. I have to be able to defend it. And so I like a little It's pushback. that intellectual competitiveness. Were, are, are, were, you, uh, were you, you, you said you did soccer, right? All the way I through college? A, I played soccer in high school and college. And I played baseball in high school and tried out in college. But they were preseason ranked number one in the nation. So I wasn't making that team. Yeah, but, but you're, you're competitive. But I tried See, it because I had to know. <laughs> it, it, where where was uh, where, what college was U it? USC. USC. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so to me, I think that's an interesting crossover too. So I, I played sports and I played football and I played uh, college. I played college football. I had a scholarship. It, it wasn't a very big school, but I playing think that football, playing college and uh, playing football in college is a big deal. Because it's, it's it was it was wonderful and all that stuff, but it's like you know when you do uh, that, that that's one thing it you can't relate to with Rogan and some of these other guys are you know competitive, competitive. You don't want to lose intellectually competitive. I don't want to look like an idiot, and uh, you you notice how that's another thing that's been kind of beaten out of the system. You know, I mean, we all kind of kid about the participation trophy, but. It's all over the place. To me, it's like when I, I, I couldn't believe when people pushed back on, on me uh, getting on people or arguing with people. It's like, bro, what, what are you talking about? Everyone's opinion doesn't matter. You don't really think everyone's opinion matters. You don't live your life like the woman wearing the double mask driving her BMW has a just as valid opinion as you do. You don't think that. So why do you want to pretend like that's a value that you want to promote? Yeah, we we better for us to challenge these ideas now internally than to allow them to go out into the world and get destroyed by some normie who who you challenges you and you just crumble. I went through that with my uh, with with uh, trying to bring up nine eleven at the Thanksgiving dinner table. I, I they challenged me on it and I folded because I wasn't prepared. And I learned some valuable lessons about how you do that, what not to do, and and and. But you you got to have that. You got to go through this. You got to you got to step on your dick a couple times and embarrass yourself and 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 learn. Okay, you don't do whether it's life or I'm not even talking about necessarily the alternative media. Just how you deal with girls, how you interact with your friend, coworkers, your bosses, and things. Probably shouldn't have said that to the boss. Oops. You know, these practice, experience. When you mentioned, you know, people's uh, opinions not mattering as much. Yeah, 
I'm not trying to say I have it all figured out. And I'm not trying to say that my opinion is the only one, but like you said, if I see somebody who's, who's, who's double masked in their car, driving around with the windows rolled up by themselves, I, I, I recognize that they don't have the level of information. They're not working off the same source material that I'm working off of. And I think my material is better than theirs. And I will challenge them because I, because I, I can back up the material that I'm working with and I don't think they can do the same. So you're right. Not everybody's opinion matters to the, ex, you know, it, not everybody's opinion is valid. Let's just be honest. Some people are fucking stupid and that's just the way it is. And, and, and I have been stupid about plenty of things. So I'm not trying to say that that's them and I'm, I'm something else. We've all done that. Um, but but in but with regard to these important world events and, and whatnot, I am always expecting somebody to push back and challenge it because it it all sounds so crazy. And I'll give them that. It does sound crazy. The first time I hear about heard about these topics and concepts and events that weren't exact exactly as we were told, it sounded crazy to me too. So but just because something sounds crazy doesn't mean it isn't true. Doesn't it doesn't mean that there isn't truth behind it and um and like your show challenges people to really start thinking about this and you know what's funny is that there aren't a whole lot of people out there challenging others to think and that i think is a huge problem okay so you've been awesome i really 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 do appreciate you uh i appreciate you like they say and that i appreciate, I appreciate you doing this professionally and all <laughs> yes. the ways in between how do we make the world better in uh, 2023? What can we do from, uh, and you, because you have a, a much bigger platform and you connect with people so much better than, than I do. And I just seem to oh, piss people off. That. How do, how do we, I have some ideas on, uh, you know, things that, that might change the world, AI and all the rest of that. But what do you think? What do we, what can we do? Well, look, first thing we got to do is we got to get it real honest with ourselves about where we are and what we're facing and what we're up against. Um, this idea that you can turn on the television and the television is your friend and you can turn on the news and the news is going to tell you what's going on in the world in 30 minutes. That needs to, I mean, it seems obvious to us and your listeners, my listeners, I mean, they, no, we're not, we're not doing that, but there is a, you've won that large... you've, you've, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to go out on a limb and you don't want to, uh, you've already won that battle in, in a substantial way. You've made the gains, you know, to kind of circle. So yeah, no one, no one's look at the numbers. No one watches CNN. Yeah. Everyone watches Rogan and Rogan is a huge step towards Charlie Robinson. If you do Rogan, then you, you have no problem swimming in the water with Charlie Robinson. So let's give that as a given. What do we really do to battle the octopus, to get the octopus in the jar? You know, like last time we were talking about, and you just had a beautiful thing where you talked about the opt octopus and how it is a good metaphor. You know, how do we get it in the tank, in the jar, whatever? Well, what, what do people say? The first, the first step in, in uh, uh, recovery is acknowledging that you have a problem, right? <laughs> so if we can get the first, we can get people to recognize that there is a problem that there is a, a, a concerted effort, a coordinated group of people that are actively trying to benefit themselves, their own self-interest. And in the wake of that, things happen to you that wind up ruining your lives. So the first step is get slap yourself and get out of this denial program where you think that, oh, that can't be happening because it sounds too crazy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Get over that. It is happening. What are we going to do? Well, there's some very practical things we can do like from a financial standpoint, I mean, when a lot of people don't really think about money, they don't think about their money. They don't think about the concept of it and how it's created and where it is and what it's, what it's doing. Um, you know, understanding that your federal reserve notes that are in your pocket are, are promises that are backed up by not just not, it used to be gold. Now it's just a promise to not get invaded by the uh, United States military and all of that, get a realistic view of, of how economically the world works and try to the extent that you can to move yourself out of the way so that you don't get hit by this gigantic tidal wave, which is hyper, you know, an inflation 
inflation of the money supply, lowering the value of your dollar and things like that. Money is um, important in the sense that, you know, you can, you need it to navigate this current paradigm that we're living in. Um, but it's not the only thing, but understanding it, I think puts you in a better scenario. Look, um, start being proactive as opposed to reactive in this society, especially in America, we get pretty soft and we get pretty used to yesterday was normal. Today is normal. Therefore tomorrow will be normal and maybe it will be. And I hope it is, but it does, there's no guarantee about that. So start thinking conspiratorial, start thinking like a paranoid person a little bit. So that might come in, a, in, in some, in, in some different forms as, it, as it relates to money. Maybe you say, well, look, I've got money in the bank, but I don't really trust the bank. So I'm going to take some of that money and I'm not going to spend it wildly on fur coats and bottle service at some nightclub, but instead I'm going to, I'm not even going to necessarily invest it. I'm just going to trans transform it from being U.S. Federal Reserve notes into silver coins or gold coins or something along this. I'm just going to change it. I'm just going to change the the way it's it's made up so that I'm not, I don't have all of my eggs in one economic basket, be that a currency basket or a national, you know, United States basket or whatever. So I, 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 I like the people that are thinking along the lines of diversifying out of the current financial system. I, and this is actually what kind of started me on the second book with, with Berwick, who does the dollar vigilante and the crypto vigilante was we were talking about, he was talking about the, the financial system and how it's, it really, when you look at it, it's, 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 it's a house of cards and it's been held together with duct tape and, and all that good stuff. But you can only do that for so long before your, you know, before everything kind of, comes unglued and uh and he's saying oh it's all coming down you know like a controlled demolition and i would agree with him on that so why why why, why do you guys why do you guys continue to beat that drum that you've beat forever i mean I, let's look at it from another perspective let's look at it as a global competition right everyone's got their crypto crypto is equivalent to fiat currency right mm -hmm. so the only thing you want to do they've already kind of schooled you in how to do it with whole ftx you just got to pick the best crypto right, right now the best crypto in the world is the us dollar where are you gonna where else where else are you gonna put your crypto it's the best bet going right now. I'm just saying that, there, that, that there's 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 ways around. If you have more money than you know what to do with, and you're looking to diversify out, buy land. Yeah, buy productive farmland. And this this is. But but again, now I come now I get into my real estate world, which is where I've been for 25 years. And people would say, well, what do you think about real estate? I would say. I would say hold off in America, hold off on the houses because we're going to see corrections there. But on the flip side, I would say I'm bullish on land, on especially productive farmland, anything that grows food, anything that grows, uh, you know, orchards, things like that. What you're smiling, you, I know you want to jump in here. And well, I, I just think this. it's it's the it's the soccer, you know, mm -hmm. it's soccer, baseball, it's a scramble, dude. It's a scramble investment advice. The investment advice is be a better investor than the other guy. So you kick his ass and so you get his money because that's what it's about. That's what investment is about. It's a zero sum game. You buy the stock or you short the stock. Someone wins, someone loses. And th that's cool thing about money. So when we talk about it as if it's something different, I think we're immediately on the wrong foot. You know, when they talk about the uh, world economic collapse, because what, where is all that money going to go? Right now, we're in a great situation. You know, where if you were a global investor and you had to park that money someplace, where would you put it? Would you put it in China right now? Would you put it in Europe right now? Would you put it in Japan right now? You're running out of options. You'd put it in the USA. That's where you'd put it. Just not with if, if you're totally dispassionate about the... Uh, origin or loyalty or anything like that it's just clearly the best right now it could change but well the dollar is dominant for the currencies and it will and be how is dominant it, how, currency and how has the dollar done in the last uh, few years the dollar the dollar has done well in the last few years yeah 
Actually, it's done well. I mean, everything else is slipping, but I would say it is, it is, it is a, uh, it's the smartest kid in the special ed class right now. Well, we only have one classroom. <laughs> I don't love it long term. I don't love the infl the inflationary component of it. I don't like the Fed. I don't like any of that stuff. I think that that stuff is a house of cards waiting to collapse. But they, the but they took away your option, which you knew they were going to take away. You knew they weren't going to let Bitcoin and crypto ever threaten them in any way. So you want to talk about the short lifespan. It's, you know, it just, it, it can't, why? I mean, if you have the power of the United States government and you have the power of AI to crack every, you know, every code as AI and quantum computing gets there and there's no security and the, it's who's ahead of the game in cybersecurity, uh, you're, you're just going to let this, you're going to let this Bitcoin thing just, you know, run, run its own? No, you wouldn't. I mean, if you could, if you could stop it, you would, wouldn't you? If, if you were the guy in charge of the U.S. dollar, if you could stop it, you would. This is where I'm at a disadvantage when it comes to the technology component behind it, because I don't know the sort of, I, I'm not the, the programmer that you are and that everyone else, you know, they say, well, it's in, you know, it's this security, whether it's Bitcoin or Monero or something that has all these, you know, the privacy features baked into it. I'm really unqualified to, to say, oh, well, this is uncrackable or something like that. Because again, like you said, quantum computers, you give that thing enough, uh, enough time to run and and you can crack the things that are, are supposedly uncrackable so I, I wouldn't ever say that i don't think that that's a possibility i would definitely agree that the united states government if they find a way to compromise crypto or control it or crack it or however you want to phrase it if they have the opportunity to do so they will do so for sure there's nothing in their past that leads me to believe that they would not try to influence that. I would well, you remember that. the test case to me, you, you just look at the look at the evidence, follow the data, right? So I forget the, the couple, uh, but we can easily find it. I looked it up. It was Heather Morgan and Ilya Lichtenstein, and they stole $8 billion in Bitcoin. They traced it down. Everyone said, well, they'll never get it because it's untraceable. No, they traced him down. You can go watch the, the documentary. I saw it on American Greed with uh, mm -hmm. Stacey Keach. He's so interesting because of his background. Show. It's a great show. I love that show. But they found that they already, in doing that, in, in winning that case, they kind of played their hand, which is like, you're sitting back thinking your Bitcoin is somehow secure. Well, it's secure only to the extent that we don't go looking. Because if we want to go looking, we know where it's at. We know what transactions you made. We know where you spent it. So great. You want to put it there or you want to put it in the bank or you want to put it in go. I don't care, but we're tracking it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're, they're anything that threatens that sort of established system. Clearly they're, they're going to want to come after. Uh, and I don't blame them because if it's a threat to to their dominance, they're going to act like people that are threatened and 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 come over the top, and 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 look, crypto is one one component that we're we're dealing with. They're starting, to, and you may and you can uh, let's just say you can get to a point where you can compromise crypto, you can comp compromise Bitcoin. I would say that a, that a that a bigger component of this is that they're trying to just compromise ideas. They're trying to get people so disconnected in real, uh, from reality that they're, that they're, you know, they don't know what to do. They throw their hands up and go, daddy government, just tell me what to think. Tell me what to believe. Tell me where to go, what to do. Like, I'm so tired of, of all of this. There's a lot of people in this world that need to be told what to do. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a reality you come to much later in life. I think as a kid, you know, you're always you're told what to do because your parents, and then you grow up and you go, well, when I'm an adult, then I get to tell other people what to do. And then you walk around, and you realize there's a bunch of adults that they need to be told what to do as well, and they never grow out of that. And and the government is perfect with their partners in the media, 
for deciding that they're going to be the ones to tell you how to feel or tell you how to how to what to do or to stand with Ukraine or 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 put, you know do this put this in your you know there's a hundred genders and and you could be cake gender and men have periods and that's totally fine and you need to be you people are getting to the point now where they reality biology these are like these are subjective concepts that are that are easily you know that people say well you know biology is subjective and you go really. It is. It's totally subjective. You can just pretend that you're somebody else. That's that's interesting. How does that work? What is your passport? What does it say? What does your passport say? Does your passport say male or female, or does it say cake gender? You know. So so there's all of these these uh, you know there are these new ideas out there, and the new ideas are that uh, nobody knows anything. Everything's free free form. You can be whatever you want. I'm going to identify as a salamander tomorrow. And, and that's normal and stunning and brave. And if you question that, then you're the problem. How dare you question this? And it, it, it feels like we're diverging from reality at a, at a, at a really alarming pace. And that, that to me, you ask like, where do we go in the future? And, you know, and what, what's up, what are we optimistic about? There's a lot of us and few of them. We're going to work this thing out. I'm optimistic in this sense. You know, human beings are amazing. And when we get together, we can, we know what's best for us. And we know what's, you know, we, we, I'm not worried that we're going to make it through this. I think we're going to make it through it, but boy, there is a, there's a battle for the minds of these young people out there to try and get them to believe unbelievable things. And I really worry about that. And, and I'm not worried about myself so much. I'm just worried about the new generation that is viewing victimhood as a, as a, as, as some sort of something to be elevated uh, that there there's a, I, I've described it as the victimization decathlon where it's like, Oh yeah, well you think you've got it bad. Well, listen to me. I'm a non-binary one-legged Eskimo with ADHD and I qualify, you know, I tick all these boxes and everyone's like, Oh wow. You know? So I think that that's a sickness. I think that's a, long term for society that's not healthy that we're going down that path so i do have some some fears about that but o overall i'm um look we're the ants they're the grasshoppers in this scenario they there's so many more of us than there are of them we just and we don't need you've seen the studies you don't need a hundred percent of the people to get on board with the plan you need three percent you need a surprisingly small percentage of people to figure this out and then cultural norms start shifting back and of course let's not forget about this societal whiplash effect of of cultures where you get so crazy one side that it snaps back the other side so there's that sanity wave that we hope will be coming over us at some point soon so um there's a lot to be worried about to be fair um but we're on such a amazing planet it's so magical and you can you and i've had the ability to travel i'm sure you have too and you get around and you you get out into these places that are quiet and you go if i didn't know about the world economic forum i wouldn't know about the world economic forum you know i'd be sitting here on this in this uh picnic table here on maui on my 50th birthday looking out over the water going none of that stuff's bothering me right now maybe it's all in my head and maybe they want it that way Beautiful, beautiful. So, so cool. How do people keep it going for everything that you're doing and keep being inspired by the information that you're bringing forward? Always with uh, a, a little bit of humor, with an upbeat tone, not doom and gloom. You, you, you have an amazing ability to deliver some hard facts in a way that doesn't totally suck all the energy out of you. So what's coming up for you? How do people stay stay focused in on what you're doing well first of all thank you for that i tried to deliver this bad news in a way that doesn't sound so bad because i don't think it's the end of the world i do believe i am optimistic i think we can get get through all of this i i like to i i don't respond well to to the the, the real scary stories i like i always like the john stewart show did the daily show when he when john stewart was doing it because he would talk about you know he'd give you kind of the news but it, there'd be a funny undertone to it you know he'd end with a little joke and i would i would laugh at the humor i would understand the serious nature of what he was talking about and i liked getting my information that way 
and and I'm no John Stewart. Let me be clear, but 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 that idea of 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 having some fun with the information and not making it, you know, not not being disrespectful. I'm not trying to laugh at people's misery or anything like that, but 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 you do have to laugh at how crazy things have gotten. And, and if you are unable to do that, it's it's going to be a long ride. So. Macroaggressions as a podcast goes out twice a week, once as a monologue, once as an interview and in audio format, wherever podcasts are served and in video format on band.video and rockfin and odyssey and vigilante.tv, because these are the only places where I can't, you know, I can't be on YouTube anymore. They've made that decision for me. I, I think we should retest that. I, we're going to I mean, talk I'm, about that when we we're going to talk about that when we hang up. And, and okay, so. okay, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm open to that. Um, and uh, in the books, uh, well, the website is theoctopusofglobalcontrol.com. You can find my books there. I'm going to be speaking, like you mentioned, at an Arcapulco with a bunch of uh, interesting characters, and we're gonna we're gonna see what what happens there. Um, but look, I appreciate you personally. I appreciate the show, the conversations. It's um. I don't have it all figured out, man. I'm, I'm, I'm working off of, I'm working off of, um, I'll tell you what, there's, there's a quote, I'll, I'll wrap it up with this because there's a quote in the, in, in my octopus book that I really liked. And I'm not going to read, I'm not going to read it because it's, it's a couple paragraphs, but it, it, it goes something like this. It's Stephen Bassett. We're mentioning UFOs. It's Stephen Bassett, the executive director of Paradigm Research Group, which normally focuses on UFOs, right? But he, he describes it as, he says, you're born into this world and you're given this box, this jigsaw puzzle box with 10,000 pieces in it. And this is the truth about reality. This is the, this is how it all works, right? And you're given this box when you come into this world and you go set about trying to figure out, put this puzzle together, right? You, and there's, there's a bunch of pieces. He says, but there's a problem. And the problem is that the government that you're living under has decided to interfere with your truth process. They've taken some of the pieces of your box and they've thrown them away. And he said, that's a problem. He says, but it gets even worse because they've taken a couple pieces out of other people's boxes and put them in your box. And now you go about your life with the understanding that if you can just put this puzzle together, it will be the way reality works. It will be, it will make all, all the sense in the world to you. But he says, you just don't have all the pieces. And so he said, it's, a, it's, it's very frustrating for human beings, but it's very effective for the state. And, it re, and that just kind of reminded me of this. It's, it's we're on this, you know, we've, I've got my box and I'm putting these pieces together. But Alex, I don't even know if I've got all the right pieces, to be honest with you. And, and I'm trying to put this one, it looks like it's going to fit. Sometimes it doesn't fit and that's okay. And we have to recognize that. So, so it is my hope and intention that through the rest of my journey on this planet that I, um, I either get some of these pieces put in the puzzle or I link up with people that have the pieces that I need for this puzzle. And they can have the pieces from my puzzle that don't fit too. I'm, I'll, I'll go, this goes both ways. Uh, so that I can try and under make sense of this because the way it stands right now, it's very hard to figure out this world that we're living in. You are so awesome, buddy. Thanks again. Thank you.